the seven point minimum scenarios for the 2013 election regarding specifically the tyranny of numbers. Now, when we did the scenarios, we assumed three things. Number one, we do not see things as they are. We see them as we are, quoted from a thinker. Number two, assumption that we have all made up our minds. We do not want to be confused by the facts. And these are the two assumptions that are likely to power this election. So what are the facts? We divide the facts into two. There are those facts that we call historical, and there are those facts that we call factual, as they are released, or they were released by IBC. Fact number one, we vote as tribes. Or oh, has this changed? I doubt it. If we vote as tribes, then assumption is that we will vote as a tribe in this election, or as tribes in this election. Fact number two, this election was already concluded and won on December 18, 2012, after the registration. Well, as some people are sleeping through the revolution during the registration, others were scheming. The, 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 the facts that are um, uh, numerical, we look at the raw ethnic numbers by IEBC. You can see here the Yama vote is 4.3 million. The Kalenjin vote is 1.8 million. If indeed we're going to vote as uh, ethnic groups, the ethnic alliance of both Gemma and the Kalenjin then has 6.1 or 6.2 million votes. The coalition that brings together Code as the Lu is 1.676 million, and 80% of the Kamba vote at 1 million. And Turkana, for good measure, we threw them into court as well. We could have thrown anybody, but for good measure, just to pump up the figures. And that gives you 2.8 million votes for COD, if we are to vote ethnically. Now, this is how we broke up numbers. Within Jubilee, the Kikus are there. You can see that 3.8, 3.4 million. The Kikus registered with annoyance. Kiambu alone, for instance, has close to 1 million votes. The Kalenjin there give you 1.8 million. And then, of course, the Embu and the Mero give you 866 million votes. If they all vote as a block, this is what gives us 1.2 million votes. The Luos there are at 1.5, at 6 million, or close to 1.6 million. Then you add the 80% Kamba vote, which is 1.2. Uh, three or thereabouts, including the Turkanas, and the total is 2.8 uh, million votes. And then, of course, the money. And here we assume that all the Luyas will go with Mudafari, but we could be so fundamentally wrong with that. And if you take all the Luya uh, uh, votes and you add them all to code, you still get about 4.6 million votes, which is still almost uh, a million and a half away from what Jubilee starts with. The other 36 communities of Kenya, which are also being known as the swing votes, then are at 3.4 million. This is basically the ethnic breakdown if, if ethnicity is, is a reference point in this election. Now, is it possible for any of the coalitions to hit the first round victory? As they've been telling us, they'll do it in 90 minutes. Let us examine the facts as they are. What is a 50 plus 1 percent cutoff? And it is at 7.17 million votes. And this is if we vote 100 percent voter turnout. But then number two, what is the ethnic starting point for each of the coalitions? As we have already submitted, Jubilee has 6.2 million. Court begins with 2.8 million in terms of its ethnic stronghold, well, as a man is ethnic stronghold is 1.8 million. So as you can see, no coalition is starting from the cutoff point of 7.1 million votes. But then we also ask the question, which coalition is closest to the cutoff point? What is the level of effort to be applied by each coalition to get to this particular cutoff? Let us look at the statistics and see what they tell us. So we begin with Jubilee. What's the Jubilee starting point? Jubilee starting point is 6.18 or 6.2 million, which is shy by about 
900,000 uh, votes from uh, the cutoff. Code starting point is 2.8 million. Money starting point is 1.78 million votes. But what does this mean? If indeed voting is a solid historical reference point, then Jubilee ethnic support or ethnic base is two and a half times that of code. What this essentially means is that every Lu and Kumba voter must, who is supporting code, must vote twice to get to where Jubilee is. It means that they have to illegally go and vote in the morning and vote in the evening without fail for them to be able to get where the Jubilee is. But even then, that is a tall order. But as we have also mentioned, if the Luya Nation abandoned the money and voted for code overwhelmingly the last month, this only adds up to 4.6 million votes as a starting point against Jubilee's 6.2 million votes. This is what we are calling the tyranny of numbers, and so we are saying the election was already won by December 18th when we finished registering. But regarding the level of effort, we must ask the question, how many votes does each of the coalitions require to reach the 50 plus 1 percent? The Jubilee starting point is 6.2 million, as you can see. The code starting point is 2.8 million. The Amani starting point is 1.8 million. But what is the Jubilee level of effort? Jubilee level of effort is 980,000. That's all they require to hit the mark of 7.1 million and get uh, win the election round one. But what does code require to win the election round one? Code requires 4.3 million votes according to IABC. Uh, the IABC register and the way we have uh, simulated it ethnically. And how about the money? What does the money require? It requires 5.27 million votes to reach that particular point. But what does all this mean? How do we analyze this? Now the analysis of this is very simple, that for every one vote, Jubilee has to mobilize to reach 50 plus 1 percent. Code has to mobilize four votes. And the level of effort, therefore, and the ratio of the level of effort is 1 to 4. That is 1 for Jubilee, 4 for, for Code. And this means, therefore, that Code has to work four times harder and spend four times more even spend four times more sleepless nights as the, the, the Jubilee uh, the, the fellows are spending only one night uh, for them to be able to even out. So for every one vote persuaded by Jubilee, Cod has to lose four. And for every four votes persuaded by Cod, Jubilee will lose one. That is in pursuit of the 50 plus one percent cutoff. So the question is, who will get there? This is what we are calling the tyranny of numbers. What about the swing vote? Uh, uh, where will it go? I want to assume that we add it all to court. We assume that all the remaining 36 communities will get annoyed and vote for, for court. Where will that take court? As you can see, the, 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 the Jubilee support is there, 6.2 million. So you take the Lua support, you add the Kamba support, and then you take all the 36, uh, all the 36, uh, uh, the entire 36 uh, communities added together. You add them all together, and you ask, so where does that leave code? It takes them to 6.2 million votes. And as you can see, not very far away from where, uh, the, 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 from where Jubilee basically is. And the money, as you can see, is down there. Even if you had to take the entire 36 communities, they're also known as a swing board, and you give them to the to Amani, will they reach the 50 plus 1 percent? I doubt it. But if you had to take all the 36 and you give them to Jubilee, I think the results are obvious right there. So what is a coalition of the 38 tribes? Would the 38 tribes then make a difference if the Luas and Kamba are joined by all the 36? Would they reach that particular point? As I have said before, it is difficult. So our conclusion here is really that the tyranny of numbers of the entire country is going to be, ter going to be terrorized through these particular numbers by only two or so communities, as it were. Regarding the runoff, are there surprises that we are likely to see? I think the first fact is that the runoff 
will most likely be between Jubilee and Cod. That is if it happens. The second fact uh, is that this runoff presupposes a voter tunnel that is similar across board. That is, everybody, all the coalitions will have a similar runoff rate, will have a similar turnoff rate. 50% turnoff, uh, 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 50% turnout for everybody or 100% turnout for everybody across board. That's amongst the coalitions. But if the swing vote is distributed equally amongst the coalitions, but voter turnout is low for court, then Raila will become number three. And the trouble in our view is that the people who will compromise the Raila candidature are the Kamba if they are not completely persuaded because they can be swayed in any particular direction. And uh, this is how, in our thinking, well, of simple simulation, we assume that Jubilee turnout is 50% and court turnout is 50%. And then a money turnout happens to be 70%. You see, in a situation, a scenario like that, definitely the runoff will be between Jubilee, that is Uhuru Kenyatta and Co, and Amani. We offer some unsolicited recommendations. Recommendation number one, completely unsolicited, Raila's strategy should be to stop Jubilee from winning first round. If he does not stop them from winning first round, he will not have the second chance of doing a runoff. Similarly, he must stop Amani from kicking court that position ahead of the runoff. I think these two realities are things Raila cannot ignore. Second recommendation, totally unsolicited, is that ICC trials should be deferred until the two suspects are declared winners. And uh, with these scenarios, our thinking is that they ain't showing up at the Hague. They will not go, they will stay here in Kenya they will refuse to go on the 10th and on the 11th if it is clear that they are winning. Whether we have a runoff or no runoff, whether they win first round, they will not show up. So the best case for purposes of preserving the country is to ensure that those trials are deferred. Then number three, those threatening sections, especially the Western nations, should start preparing the package. And they should do so seriously. They need to move from rhetoric to action. And this is because a tiger does not declare its integrity, it pounces. And if it don't pounce, because they have been threatening to pounce, the tyranny of numbers will have absolutely no mercy. Everything said in this clip is hypothetical. It must also be innovative.